a large amount of research in adaptive optics here at ANU. It's a great pleasure to welcome Céline d'Orgeville and François Rigaud, who are some of our local experts. Céline works on the lasers that are used in adaptive optics, and François works on the adapt adaptive optic systems themselves. Mm -hmm. So, François, you are, I guess, despite your young age, one of the grandfathers of the field of adaptive optics. Yes. Uh, from my memory, uh, you were part of the first uh, program to put adaptive optics on a telescope which we are allowed to know about. I believe there were ones that the military did before, but what was it like working uh, back in 1989 on that first system? Well, it was very, very exciting. I, I was actually lucky enough to uh, do my PhD, and it was, I believe, the second PhD ever on adaptive optics for astronomy. So uh, on the first adaptive optic system for astronomy ever. So um, it started in 1989, and it was in Europe, in France, actually. At the time, uh, we had also collaboration with ESO uh, at the time. And uh, at, at the time, we didn't know if it was going to work, of course. So uh, we assembled everything in the lab. And, uh, and then we went to the telescope in Haute-Provence, in the south of France, at uh, 1.5 meter. And then we turned the system on, and it was working and reducing you know, uh, uh, the, the, the image size from like maybe typically one octagon or 1.5 octagon down to like 0.4, which was the diffraction limit. So how were those systems different than the ones we use today? Well, they were much simpler. Um, they were the same, if you want. Uh, essentially, it's the same. In, in this system, what you do is that you analyze the deformation of light, and then you correct it with some kind of device. Yeah. So, uh, but now, nowadays, these systems are like 100 times more potent, because they have many more, you know, these, these little actuators that you use to correct the light, and they are also uh, installed on telescopes of typically 8 to 10 meters instead of the 1.5 meter at the time. So back in 1989, did you have powerful lasers to make your own little beacons, or no, did you just use yeah. stars? Yes, exactly. At, at the very beginning, uh, we used stars because it was already, you know, wonderful. And then quickly, we realized that even though the, the technique was very powerful, it was, uh, uh, however, limited in its in its capabilities, just because you needed such a bright star to analyze the waveform. So. And in 1985, actually, the first civilians or astronomers, actually, a researcher, came up with the concept of shooting your own laser to actually create an artificial guy star in the uh, upper atmosphere at about 100 kilometers. And since then, uh, people have been working, integrating these lasers with the adaptive optic system to make them uh, all uh, encompassing, if you want. We can now point everywhere and, uh, and get nice images. So you put a star anywhere in the sky, and that's a huge advantage we have exactly. uh, nowadays. Yep, so Celine, oh, the lasers are often the technically hardest part of the thing to get right. At least they seem to be broken most of the time, and every time I hear a telescope bulletin saying delay, it's usually because of the lasers rather than anything else. What are the challenges? Why is it so hard to get a laser to make a star like this? Well, to get started, there, there isn't that many people interested in producing, you know, powerful lasers at that kind of wavelength. We're talking 589 nanometer, that's the sodium line, uh, it's bright orange, and we want typically 10 watt per laser guide star, so one laser guide star, 10 watt, five laser guide stars, 50 watt. This kind of laser power you don't get, you know, off the shelf. Actually, there's no laser company until, you know, maybe two years ago that could deliver such a system. So I guess most lasers are used for fiber optic communications and they work in the infrared, not at these wavelengths. Well, there's lasers working, you know, all over the spectrum, from the UV to the infrared, really, but uh, at this particular wavelength, typically it's been used for, you know, spectroscopy experiments in the lab and they use just a few milliwatts for that. So for astronomy, we need, you know, watts yeah, and so tens 10 of watts. watts is a really big laser. It's, it's, it's a pretty powerful laser at that yes. point. And so you had to uh, develop the technology to get there. And there's been several generations of sodium lasers. So the first lasers were uh, liquid lasers. They, they use liquid dye as the a laser medium. Um, and, and they've done a good job, but, you know, they were cumbersome to uh, use and a bit uh, uh, unsafe in that uh, they run with alcohol and so there was a flammable issue with those. So eventually people went to solid state uh, types of lasers and that's what, uh, for instance, runs on the Gemini North and Gemini South telescopes in Hawaii and Chile. Um, and the next generation one are going to be fiber lasers. So the technology is definitely improving. I would say at this point the lasers run well. We know how to operate them. 
they're not the issue. The problem is with the logistics of propagating a powerful laser beam to the sky. So typically, you have to deal with um, aircrafts going over the, the observatory, and you don't want to hit those. So you need some sort of uh, either spotters watching the night sky or some automated system based on cameras uh, to make sure that you're going to terminate the beam propagation when a, an aircraft is flying over. That and means it, uh, turn them off when an aircraft's coming over? Yeah, yes. you just close the shutter and you, see, you know, okay. close, shutter the beam, but the rest of the system is still operating normally. Yep. Um, the other thing you have to uh, take care of, at least for observatories that uh, um, have a, um, US as a partner, uh, is to um, make sure that they're not going to fire the laser into a satellite and damage it. So they have to um, work with a US Space Command to get you know, approval to propagate the laser at any given time. And they don't just tell you here are the orbits the satellites avoid them. You have to tell them where you're going to look. Yeah. They either say yes or no. Yeah. Exactly. You can't know where the satellite is because it's usually an asset they don't want to reveal. But um, you send them the list of what you want to observe through the night, and they send you a list back saying, OK, from that time to that time, you can't propagate. 